We now move into our next session, an expert talk on the topic, imagining a hyper-connected world with the loop technology, where our next speaker will talk about upcoming trends in the global hyperloop technology industry, power of engineering to enable a sustainable future in transportation and opportunities in India. Our very special guest for this session is Josh Gaijul, co-founder of Virgin Hyperloop. Josh is an engineer, innovator, a technologist, and an entrepreneur. He co-founded Virgin Hyperloop and served as its CTO and eventually CEO for seven years, leading development of the first full-scale Hyperloop system. In addition to building a world-class team of over 300, he was the first passenger to ever ride in a Hyperloop system in November of 2020. He started his career at SpaceX, where he served as the lead analyst designer on the Merlin 1D and Super Dranko family of rocket engines, as well as microgravity fluidix for the Dragon spacecraft. It's an honor and a privilege to have you join us uh, this morning. Josh, over to you. Thank you, Justin. It is great to be here. And thank you, NASCOM, for having me. So it's really exciting to get a chance to talk to you about the opportunities in the transport space and really the opportunity for India. And after many trips to India, there are several unique challenges to transport in India. But with every challenge comes a very, very unique opportunity. So I'm an engineer at heart, and really I would want to show you today the power of analysis and the, like to talk to you through the opportunity to transport and some of the opportunities I see in India as well as other places. So one of the things I like to ask myself is, why do we move as humans? Why have you moved at various times throughout your life? What was the reason? Largely, we exist as a species because our ancestors decided to get up and move from their original locations. Well, not quite nomads, the ability to move from tribe to tribe allowed our civilization to grow, allowed trade to, to exist. And around 6,000 years ago, the wheel was invented and we really never looked back. So the primary reason we move, I feel the primary reason we move is for proximity to opportunity. We move to be closer to a dream job we move closer for a chance, of, we move closer to family, to experience new things, to meet new people. And all those things are opportunities for us to be something better, to do something more interesting, to do something better. So movement is absolutely critical to what we want to do. But what's next in mobility? I think we feel that mobility has stagnated to a degree. It feels like the available options are the same as they've been for a very long time. So much of our life has changed and so much of our life has profoundly improved over the past century from different technologies like cell phones and wireless and the internet. But transport feels something that was stuck in the past. I think this figure really illuminates that. What could be next? Electrification isn't a new mode, but rather it's an improvement of existing modes. Is it autonomous driving? How close are we to ubiquitous autonomous adoption? How well will that work in places like India? I think those are really large questions that we need to consider and what's next. And the additional factors beyond just what we talked about, I think are very insightful to figure out how to develop not only the next big thing, but something that is, is largely lasting and impactful to what is next. So one of these factors that I found very, very interesting is what's called the Marchetti constant. So this is basically how much people are willing to spend commuting each and every day. It was characterized by this Italian physicist named Cesare Marchetti, who really just wanted to see how long people traveled both now and a long time into the past. So at Hyperloop, we spent a lot of time looking at this. And one of these specific examples I like to talk about is I had an engineer who grew up in Penang, And one of the stories he'd like to tell me is that his parents worked in Mumbai. And so each Sunday they would get on the train, they'd go, and they wouldn't be back until Friday. And it was really powerful to see that come from one of my engineers who didn't really get to see his parents growing up. And it's something that really stuck with me as like, okay, this is something that we need to do quite a bit better. So Marchetti described this effect, and you can see in these next couple of charts that from ancient Rome, basically it was a walkable city that didn't really change over the next thousand years. You look at Paris, you know, in the 1300s, not much different than Rome. But then you can start to see London with the advent of rail and subway. You can begin to see the impact of high, having higher speed transportation on the size of the city. Trains were faster than walking, so people could live further away. 
the speed and frequency of transport further increased in Chicago in the early 20th century, cities could become even larger. And with the most profound effect being the commuting car cities of the United States. Well, the urban sprawl and the growth has been enabled by ever increasing proliferation of faster transport modes. The journey times have been roughly the same for the past 2000 years. And I think that's absolutely fascinating. This consequence of what Mark Shady basically illuminated was that no matter how long we've been in the past, we don't like to spend more than about an hour a day commuting. However, is it the only thing? So ask yourself, is speed all that matters in this thought process when it comes to mobility? Is speed the only thing that could matter? And the short answer is no. So we know we don't want to spend more than about an hour each day commuting. And we want to spend less than about 10% of our total income paying for it. So speed could allow us to live further away or live where we want to, but only if the cost of transport decrease or the cost of living is so much lower where we want to move to. For me, that's a really incredible, interesting observation and an opportunity for the engineer, for the entrepreneur to go after. So as an example, I love the mountains, but I live in Los Angeles. Even if there was something that could get me to work in 30 minutes and I could live 200 kilometers away, I could only do it if it was cheap enough per kilometer for me to get there. So if I think about my earlier story about my engineer whose parents lived in Pune, this is the reason they were basically going in on Sundays and coming back on Fridays is because even if there was something fast enough, the cost wasn't going to be there. So this cost is best reflected in the marginal cost of transport, which simply put is just the incremental cost of going that next mile. And oftentimes it's the only thing that you're paying for in fares. A lot of fares are subsidized to the extent you're only paying these these marginal costs. But if we dive into that a little bit more, it really is insightful. So we see most public transportation has a cost of about 10 to 30 cents per passenger kilometer. And these are US, European figures, so apologize for that. But a 20 kilometer bus ride is about $3. A 200 kilometer high-speed rail ride is about 80. And a 2,000 kilometer plane ride is about $200. That is feel, feel about right. But car ownership is very interesting. So the cost of pur purchasing, insuring, and maintaining a car is a large portion of the cost, which isn't explicitly the marginal cost, which is this little orange bar I show here. And that's largely the fuel cost. And the interesting observation here is that the people who are already paying for the blue, the car owners, they look at this problem very, very differently. So in a heavy car culture, like here in the US, the marginal cost of riding a bus or a transit system, when I already own a car, usually means it's cheaper, not to mention more convenient, for me to just take my own car and to take public transport when I own a car. Now I'll reiterate that for a second. If I already own a car, it would be cheaper for me to use the car for my trip in public transport. In India, these economics look very, very different. And that's where I think there's also a lot of interesting opportunity in India. But if I take this all the way a bit further, if I look at things like Uber, taxis, Uber Black, electric vertical takeoff and landing, you can see these are much, much higher priced options. In my view, these are always gonna be niche opportunities, products serving a higher end market than something most of us can afford, especially on a daily basis. And so it's never, they're never really gonna change your lives, although they may be a technical novelty or something exciting. And living 10 times further away means my transport needs to be about 10 times lower. So the 21st century also demands that we focus not just on speed and cost, but also on sustainability. So India is acutely aware of these issues. We know with continued global warming, parts of India may become uninhabitable in the near future, which is something that's extremely concerning. So the fact is our collective mobility contributes significantly to climate change. I think we know that. The emissions that we produce are more exacerbated the more we travel. So generally speaking, the faster we go, the more energy you can, we consume. You can see that with airplanes here. The less we share a vehicle with others, the more we emit. Meaning if we drive by ourselves, we're gonna emit more than if we ride together. But the more electrified our system, the more we end up actually saving. And so sustainability, in my opinion, is more than just emissions. These visuals might be very, familiar, maybe all too familiar for a number of the audience here. But my first time going to India and witnessing some of these scenes, going to the train station, seeing these, 
they were absolutely incredible. Some of the people I would show would be shocked at like, wow, what is going on? How, how can this be? But I was actually blown away kind of for a different reason. I look at what people were willing to do, the conditions they were willing to kind of endure for their family, for access to opportunity, for that proximity to opportunity to make a better life. And I was really left in awe about what people were willing to do. So sustainability has to be coupled with productivity and opportunity. In Hyperloop, we were trying to do that. But sustainability also needs to be sustainable for the people doing it. And sustainability is the process of letting people live the way they want to live while not destroying the world around us. And that's how I view sustainability. So as we go forward, when we combine sustainability and economic aspects together, we can kind of see the current technology landscape. We see where air sits. We see where rail, bus, and car sit. We see something like electric vertical takeoff and landing. We see where they sit on the price spectrum. We also see where they sit on the emission spectrum. When we fully electrify these systems, we can see the decrease in emissions intensity for most of these modes. Something like sustainable, either biosourced or agricultural source aviation fuel can bring that down. But there still is the opportunity for the transport designer to really go after a low cost, low emissions solution that could be completely transformative. So what's next? Well, what's next has to be faster. It has to be cheaper. It has to be moving mass amounts of people and it has to be greener. So it was with this in mind that we decided to found Hyperloop Technologies, which later became Virgin Hyperloop. The attention that Elon Musk had drawn to the problem and to a potential solution for it didn't hurt our cause either. So a colleague of mine from SpaceX, a venture capitalist, and I started it back in November of 2014 in a garage. You can see some of the pictures here when I had more hair and less facial hair. Uh, but how did we approach the problem? We're starting a new company, going after a big idea. How did we start the problem, right? And the old adage of how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. So for us, the only way a good engineer knows how to solve a problem is go back to the physics. And so at SpaceX, I learned early on in my career how to be an engineer. The responsibility, the energy, the passion, the enthusiasm were necessities, but the real work came in understanding how to go back to first principles understanding of how your design, how your system, or how your product actually work. And if there wasn't something that existed to solve your problem, go invent it. Don't be a slave to your tools, was the, the motto that one of my mentors taught me there. So if we go back to the core of our issue, energy is from a sustainable, so we want to have less energy. Energy also directly drives the cost of the system. So what is energy? So energy is really the drag losses times the distance we travel, the kinetic energy of the vehicle, and the efficiency of the powertrain. If we do a little bit of rearranging, this gets us into a commonly used kind of distance formulation. But we can see that dis the kinetic energy term is really just something that characterizes how frequently we stop to let on passengers and let off passengers. And if we get real far into the technical weeds, we can see that this is really the aerodynamic resistance, the levitation or what's called rolling resistance, the energy lost during each stop, and that efficiency of the powertrain. So when we're going to design a solution that reduces emissions and energy consumption for the future transport system, we can basically dive into this equation and figure out all the fun different ways that we can solve this. So for example, we can make the vehicle more streamlined, right? You want a nice streamlined shape instead of a big box driving through whatever it might be that reduces the drag coefficient. We could make the vehicle smaller. We could reduce the atmospheric pressure surrounding the vehicle. That means we could fly at a higher altitude or we could put it inside of a low pressure tube like we did at, at Hyperloop. We could go slower. I don't think any of us wants to go slower. I have a little four-year-old and I can tell you he's never told me to slow down, dad. I think none of us actually ever want to slow down. So that's something that, we could do at our own peril. We can make our levitation or rolling system more efficient. We could make our vehicle lighter. We could have less stops. And we can increase the overall conversion efficiency, right? That's like going from a gasoline engine to an electric powertrain. And all of these things give us the opportunity to really go after something unique. So at Hyperloop, I decided to focus on these elements of 
the first principles to go after. So reducing the surrounding pressure, reducing the rolling resistance, having less stops and increasing the energy efficiency. It's not the only solution, but I thought it was a pretty compelling one, at least enough for me to quit my job and go ahead and start going after this particular system. So what we decided to do and characterize this is build a high speed, direct to destination, fully electric, low pressure tube, magnetically levitated and propelled pod. You can see a lot of that characterized here. You can actually see the vacuum system here. A lot of these, you can you find these videos online. But when you get in, we had mass amounts of people. We're talking about moving tens of thousands of passengers per hour. Remember, we want to move lots of people. That was on the key here. Low emissions, frequent departures, direct to destination, really increasing the experience. And then we decided to build it because it's one thing to have nice videos, something different to actually build it. So we built a system in Las Vegas, tested it full size. You'll see my pretty face in here. You could see I was so confident in the team that we had put together, the things that we had built that I was willing to go in and be one of the first passengers to actually ride in the system, which is absolutely incredible testament to the quality of the team that we've been able to build. And you can see this system getting more and more developed over the period of time. So when we look specifically at the opportunities in India, I think there's something very unique and a lot of things unique in India when it comes to transport and when it really comes to things in general. So when you look at some of the macro forces that really are tailwinds in the sales of what could make India a powerhouse, industrial engineering powerhouse in the future, really I see it as, as follows. One is a high concentration of technical talent. So you know, this, this number is somewhat shocking to me, but I love it because I'm an engineer, my whole family's an engineer, my mom, dad, sister, wife, everybody. And India graduates more than a million engineers each year. It's shocking. It's amazing. The ability to become a powerhouse with expertise. We've heard a couple of the other speakers talk about the talent that exists here. That is something that is tremendous and really almost unmatched anywhere else in the world. The other thing that's very interesting from a, from a product opportunity is there's an unprecedented amount of migration to cities. Something like 300 million people moving to cities over the course of the next 20 to 30 years in India. That's almost the whole population of the United States moving into urban centers or into proximity to urban centers. So when you think about transport, when you think about connectivity, uh, housing, you look at some of these opportunities, that's an enormous amount of, of economic potential and opportunity to rethink the way that we go after these problems. It's a highly price sensitive market. That makes entering the market exceedingly difficult. But what is, you know, one person views as a, as a risk, another person views as an opportunity. By being able to enter the market, if you do it right, you're actually able to tap the entire world market because you've been able to develop a low cost, very successful product in a, in a price sensitive market. That's something that gives you a unique advantage versus trying to enter into a higher price market. So for example, in the US, we used a dollar per value of time from the US Department of Labor, about $42 an hour. In India, that's you know, maybe somewhere between about five and 15. That means it's gonna be that much harder to get in the market, but once you do, you could basically tap any market that exists. Increasing awareness of, of health and well-being, particular, particularly related to pollution. So one of the things we saw and heard from our friends in, in India during the COVID situation was how the air changed, particularly in Delhi and a number of the other places, that this was something that they really enjoyed, the quality of life, those aspects as being something that is a huge opportunity. People saw what it was like, even for a brief moment, of what it could be like in the future. And they wanted that. They wanted to put in the opportunities, put in the technology that would enable that. The opportunity to basically create new and bypass existing legacy infrastructure. So example of this is installing uh, cellular as opposed to landlines, right? Those type of opportunities, when you have the need for new infrastructure and you don't either have a lot of infrastructure in existence or it's already saturated, those are the opportunities for new types of infrastructure with less of the, I'll say, incumbent burden that some of the other places in the world have. And lastly, there's the large potential for industrial base. From the talent that we saw there to the economic capabilities of the large firms that are in India, we know what can be produced there. There's a latent ability to produce a lot when the right device or the right product is actually being able to produce. But there is one opportunity that stands out above the rest for me at a personal level, but I also think for India at a national level. And it's something that I always like to ask, you know, prospective engineers is really what separates us from the animals? 
right? What is different about us as an animal versus, you know, monkeys or elephants or whatever it might be? And really succinctly put, it's the ability to manipulate energy and therefore matter in everything else. So for me, the future is all about energy. And I think the link between country wealth and energy production is undeniable. And it's been shown for really for centuries. The opportunity for domestically produced energy could absolutely transform in, uh, India. Because of India's potential, it could therefore change a large amount of the world. 1,200 terawatt hours in 2018 of energy consumption. We look at parts of where that is. And right now, India is spending lots of its hard-earned economic capital, lots of its hard-earned wealth on acquiring energy, right? Whether it be oil, whether it be gas. The opportunity to domestically produce creates jobs, it creates economic uplift, and also reduces the dependency on, on foreign powers and the subject nature of that. So it's easy to talk about some of these things, but one of the questions is like, okay, great. And how do we do that? So the two of the areas that, that I'll just cover briefly is, is solar. So one is there's really a potential for solar not to just help this energy problem, but also help the domestic energy production and industrial capacity of India itself. So instead of just buying solar panels, building the abilities to essentially manufacture those panels, creating the jobs around that, creating the industry to export those things, not only can help go after the areas, the domestic energy production, but also can begin to go after the worldwide appetite for low cost solar. Right now, solar is the cheapest way you can actually generate power. So what is the opportunity for India to both, both utilize that and also export that know-how, that possibility to the world? One of the other ones a little bit overlooked, it's the way that we've actually made power for, for millennia at this point, which is biomass. So biomass is really plant or animal waste. It's, you know, it's things that have already been used, whether it's like grown corn or grown plants or whatever that have been at the end, you can basically take those and turn those into carbon neutral fuels. And you could use those in your existing systems like diesel replacement. Largely speaking, there's a lot of economic potential inside of multiple states inside of India to utilize, to create, to essentially self-sustain some of these fuels. But then also, going after the emissions and the sustainability side, these are very close, if not carbon neutral fuel sources. So this is something that could not only be a domestic provider of energy, but also something that could offset and really reduce the emissions that occur inside of, of energy use inside of India. And really energy unlocks just about every other industry. It especially unlocks transport. A better domestically sourced energy infrastructure Will, be in, will enable whatever transport mode is next, especially the electrification of existing modes of transport. So I believe engineers and entrepreneurs should be looking into economic low emissions, mass transportation solutions for India, trying to target this yellow star that I've, that I've put in here. Solutions that alleviate congestion can dramatically enhance the GDP of the country while making life enjoyable for more than just the current people that live in city state. That 300 million that are going to come into cities, how is that going to be sustainable? How is that going to be able to be livable as we move forward? So in my view, the India of the future looks like one that has a variety of transport options where people can spend less time commuting, less pollution with much higher quality of life. So for me, I still believe in the power of transformative change, especially in transportation. I've moved on from Virgin Hyperloop to new things at the end of last year. But I believe the basic approach to first principles, engineering analysis and assumptions and understanding I used in SpaceX, we used in the formulation of, of Hyperloop will continue to yield big things. Um, so I'm working right now on a couple of plays inside the energy and the material science space and a lot more to come. But thank you, NASCOM. Thank you, Justin. Thank you all for, for having me. Thank you, Josh, uh, for that insightful talk and uh, that interesting presentation. Mm -hmm.